Hello, my name is Diana Leaf Christian, and I am a member of Gen US, one of two representatives from the Eastern US. I'm also an EDE trainer, and I'm a Gen Europe ambassador, which means I have a very cool card. I don't go to Europe very often, but when I do, I love to see my friends who are involved in Gen Europe. And um, I'm a, an aficionado and amiga of CASA in Latin America because I like those folks so much. My quick, quick background on who I am and why I presume to suggest to you three aspects of a healthy, thriving community, which is what this presentation is about, is that I have done informal research, not academic research, but informal research interviewing people to find out what helps new community startups get started successfully, how to be part of the 10% that succeed as compared to 90% of community startups which unfortunately seem to fail. Okay, what are the 10% doing? That's what I wanted to know. I also do, work I do workshops on this. I also do workshops on how your existing community can succeed and thrive. I also do workshops on sociocracy, a governance and decision-making method that I highly recommend. Okay, I've written some books. One, Creating a Life Together, has been translated to six languages, including Russian and uh, currently Korean. So I'm really quite flattered and honored about this. So that's a little bit about my background. Okay, so what I want to share with you is what I have learned that seems to help a forming eco-village or an existing one succeed and thrive. Can everybody see this little circle? So I think there are three things. I'm going to put a secret little section here and get to it last and tell you what this is, too, after we continue. Okay. Usually this is an hour presentation with lots and lots of participation from the people, but I'm going to go really fast so I can fit this into the remaining seven minutes. I hope that's fine with you. I'm just going to buzz on through. Um, when I do this in workshops, generally people who have lived in community for a while recognize it. And they say, yeah, that's right. And generally when I do workshops and I ask people, what do you remember the most? It's this. This has turned out to be quite popular. I hope you find it useful and helpful. Okay, what things help a community thrive? I'm going to start with the second one, which I call community glue or community spirit, or that sense of us, that sense of well-being that we together have, that sense of a greater we than just myself. And community glue is achieved by shared, enjoyable activities. Well, people who live in eco-villages and other kinds of intentional communities know exactly what that is. Potluck meals, shared meals, work parties, playing frisbee, playing volleyball, playing anything together, card games, board games, theater night, film night, movie night, charades, skits, jokes, singing, dancing, singing and dancing. You all know very well these things. Shared enjoyable activities tends to help each of us produce something that you will probably recognize, oxytocin. It's a hormone that our bloodstreams produce when we're in the presence of some kind of enjoyment. And it tends to create a feeling of trust and gratitude to the people and with the people we're having this shared enjoyable activity with. So let's say we're playing volleyball, like we do at my community at Earth Haven, an eco-village in North Carolina. Everybody is rooting for everyone, 
There's competition, but there's also helping and cheering for the other side. It's a very cooperative kind of volleyball. It's wonderful fun. People love it. They walk home in the dusk of the summer evening from the volleyball game on the green, beaming and smiling. Why? They're filled with oxytocin and a feeling of connection to those playing on their team, the other team, and the people watching. Oxytocin produces trust and gratitude. Trust and gratitude produces oxytocin. Shared enjoyable activities are hugely significant and important for happiness in community. It's necessary. When people are going to start a new community, this is what they think of, usually. But there's two other things. Good process and communication skills. When people don't live in community, they don't know they need this. After they've lived in community a while, they absolutely know they need this. Is that your experience if you live in community? <laughs> OK. Good process and communication skills. I'll just do that. I used to have a whole list of things I recommended. But now I only recommend two things. And I won't say too much about this so we can move on. NVC, nonviolent communication. I highly recommend it for general communication. And restorative circles which is a relatively new conflict resolution method with extremely good results at creating connection, harmony, goodwill between the people who were formerly in conflict. Restorative circles created in, in Brazil in the 1990s. No more about this for now. What's this one? I'm saving it for last. This is effective project management. We have an expensive, serious project to ongoingly manage. We're not just playing volleyball. We're not just having deep interpersonal connections. We have to actually pay the bills keep track of our agreements, make sure our agreements are available to everyone. Thank you. And uh, I think it's less than five minutes now, right? OK. All right. And um, so what does this include? Well, we have a shared purpose, and we all know what it is. We have shared values, and we know that we do. We have a shared lifestyle, and we know what it is. We have a clear, thorough membership process. So we can attract those people who want to do what we want to do. They share our purpose, our values, our lifestyle. They generally get along with most other people most of the time. How do we know? We have a trial period or a provisional period. And we understand that they need to be people who want to do what we want to do and don't want to join us and then later wipe it out, which does happen sometimes. I see some nodding heads. I'm sorry that has happened to you, but it's pretty common. OK. We also need to have ways to help our members. Time to get up. Stay accountable to our agreements. What? You mean people would break the agreements that we have made? Does this ever happen in communities? All the time. <laughs> We need to have gentle, courteous ways that are not like mainstream culture to induce our members to come into compliance with what we together have decided. Of course, we have to have clear agreements, too. So what's this in the middle? Aha. Uh -huh. I did that on purpose. Governance, which is? The structure of how we know which groups are doing which tasks, which roles, which authorities and responsibilities, how much money is being spent, how we, how we manage our time, our money, and our labor. This is drops of sweat, labor. How do we manage that? How do we keep track of it? And one of the pieces of governance is our decision-making method. Decision-making is not governance. It's a part of governance. Governance is not decision-making only. It includes decision-making. 
Effective project management, in my experience, happens through this one. If our governance is working well, we will manage our project well. If we manage our project well, we're creating community glue and oxytocin just by the fact that things aren't going wrong at a big and basic level. When we have a lot of community glue, it's like a bank account or an immune system for our community, which means that we can draw upon it like we had credit in the bank. When we have conflict, the conflict isn't as big when we have lots of community glue. These three things and governance mutually affects each other, mutually reinforces each other. If we have too few of something, if we have not very good communication skills, we never did learn NVC, we don't do restorative circles, we just talk the way we already always do. We haven't learned special skills for being in community where we're always influencing each other. We're going to need a whole lot more community glue and absolutely superb governance. If we have rotten governance because we just don't quite know how to do it or we're stuck in long, lugubrious meetings where we can't make decisions and the same things come up over and over and people are exhausted and demoralized and they quit going to meetings, I hope this has never happened to you, but it's not uncommon. Well, then we need a whole lot more good process skills. We have to have conflict resolution all the time and we sure need a lot of that, but we're not going to have a lot of that because we're going to be too demoralized to even go to the volleyball game. I'm seeing some nodding heads. Okay, here's what I'd like to suggest to you, what I'd like to leave with you. Let's have all four. Why not be abundant, rich, and wealthy in all the things that help a community succeed and thrive? Now, one last quickie. What is this? This is an annual line item in our budget for getting training and the things that will help us grow and thrive as a community. Perhaps it's permaculture design. Perhaps it's land use planning help with a consul consultant. Perhaps it's learning restorative circles or NVC with a trainer. We certainly don't need help with this. We already know how to do this. Perhaps it's a governance method. I recommend sociocracy. I'm also very fond of holacracy. Both of them are whole system methods with a governance structure and different meeting processes that work together beneficially. I recommend sociocracy because it's more available, it's more open source, it's more easy to learn. Holacracy is created for, marketed to, and priced for corporations. And this is us, the community folks, the eco-village folks, so that's why I recommend sociocracy. If a group uses consensus and wishes to continue using consensus, I suggest the in street, in like the letter in, consensus method. Email me and I'll send you a handout about it. If you're interested in sociocracy, email me and I'll send you a handout about it. Here's my email, diana at ic.org. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Okay, since we have some time left, um, I would like to ask if somebody would like to ask something to Diana, perhaps even to Kavita, which didn't have time for questions, and Sky. So, anybody, or to the guys who are first, and yeah. Um, how would you start a school, a primary school in a community? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Um, how would you s start a school for children in a community? How would a community start their own school? School. Mm -hmm. I, I think that people who know how to start a school 
in the community or locally would be able to advise the parents and members of the community. I personally don't have good information, but I know that it's possible to get it. Sometimes parents create a whole homeschooling co-op. In my community, Earth Haven, there's a homeschooling co-op for tiny toddlers and one for kids in the middle years, 10, 12, and so on. Both very successful, three days a week, about four hours a day. It's not school exactly, but it is quite wonderful. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Do you have a methodology, or would you recommend a methodology across the board for um, evaluating, monitoring feedback on how it's all going, you know, like an annual approach? I do, but it's within another system. Of course, anybody can create ways which they will later measure and evaluate any of their eco-village projects and create future upcoming dates of meetings in which they will do this. This can be built into proposals. This can be done easily. This is one of the seven parts of sociocracy. Feedback loops built into every proposal. It's one of the reasons I love sociocracy so much. What that means is when you have a proposal, you have the words of the proposal, and then you have listed ways that you can later measure it, how much, how many, how much did it cost, how long did it take, how many people did it involve, and criteria that's more subjective, like uh, do we like it, is it working well, is there something we would change, now that we're trying it out in real life, is there in real time. It's not theoretical, now we've implemented it, how might we change it for the better? Here's the thing, sociocracy is in a completely different paradigm in my experience to consensus decision making. I'm a long time consensus facilitator and trainer and I know the difference so well now that I'm immersed in sociocracy. And what I've noticed is that in a consensus meeting, we had better get the proposal damn near perfect. We have to predict the future and then control the future by getting the proposal so perfect because it's going to be so hard to change later because consensus is an essentially conservative process which tends to um, keep the status quo. It's very hard to change. Okay, now let's shift paradigms. In sociocracy, it's built into your expectation that you're going to look at every implemented proposal multiple times as you wish with criteria for measuring and evaluating. And you might tweak it, change it. You can keep it exactly as it is, throw it out, or change it. Since this is in your, your expectation, it takes the pressure off of you in the meeting. You don't have to get that proposal damn near perfect. It only has to be, and these are two mantras from sociocracy, it only has to be good enough for now and safe enough to try. And here's a third mantra that I made up. Okay, let's find out. Don't you like that? Doesn't that feel freeing? It's why I love this method. 